Quick revision video on chromatography. We'll start with thin layer chromatography or TLC for short. So we've got a stationary phase which is a solid. So examples are silica, SiO2, or alumina, Al2 or 3. And they're held on an inert support material which could be glass or plastic. I'll show you a picture of this in a second. We've got a mobile phase which is the liquid solvent and the separation is by relative adsorption. So the components in your mixture adsorb differently to the surface of the stationary phase. So they're binding with the surface of the stationary phase, they're not going into the phase. And we calculate RF values and we compare them to a database of known pure samples. So this is what it looks like. So this is on its side. So we've got the inert support material and then the stationary phase, this solid, is pasted onto the surface of this. So that black spot at the bottom is the position of your original sample. And basically the solvent, which would be sitting in the bottom of a beaker or chromatography tank to be exact, would travel up the plate, the TLC plate, and it would pull the components in the sample up with it but remember these different components are binding to the surface differently and so they bind differently and therefore that's how they separate out. So this spot at the bottom the red one is obviously absorbing the most with the stationary phase so it appears nearer the bottom and the lime green one at the top has the weakest adsorption so the mobile phase can pull it up um, much more easily. So RF values, so we've now got the TLC plate sort of looking at it front on. So your original sample would be here and you'd normally draw a pencil line along the bottom there. And then you can see the relative positions of the different, we'll call them spots. So there's two important distances. There's the distance traveled by the sample and the distance travelled by the solvent front. So the solvent front is the maximum distance the solvent travels. So the RF value is the distance travelled by the sample divided by the distance travelled by the solvent front. So some limitations of TLC, it's worth knowing these. So it's difficult to measure the exact centre of a component spot, especially when it's more like a smudge. Similar components may have very similar RF values, so sometimes it's very difficult to tell them apart. You may not even have the reference chromatogram in your database. One solvent may not dissolve all the components in the sample, so you might have one component that's just stuck at the bottom because the, um, the solvent can't interact with it. And you could have the opposite, a component may be too soluble in the solvent and just gets washed off. We'll move on to gas liquid chromatography or GC for short, we normally just call it gas chromatography. You'll see where the liquid comes in in a second. I've just got a picture here of the process so we'll be referring to this as we go. So this is used to separate the volatile components in a mixture, so things with low boiling points. Very very useful for analysing organic compounds. Again we've got a mobile phase but this time it's an inert carrier gas so the carrier gas would live in here and that's going to carry the components through this very very thin long tube called the column. The stationary phase is normally a high boiling point liquid and it's adsorbed onto the surface of a solid support. I'll show you a picture of what that looks like now. So we've got a cutaway of the column so it's a cross section. So you can see straight away I've got there, the column is approximately 30 metres long. So it needs to be that long to give the components time to separate out. So we've got the inert support material. So that's that sort of um, orange coloured um, circle there. And then we've got the stationary phase. Remember that's a, a liquid that's been pasted onto the surface of the solid support and the components are going to travel through the through the tube. 
So because we've got a liquid stationary phase, the separation is by relative solubility now, not adsorption. And in gas liquid chromatography, we measure retention time, not RF value. And all we do is, once that's measured, we compare that to a database of known pure samples. And the retention time is the time taken for the component to travel through the column, or time from injection to detection. So we'll just run through the process. Carry gas is released, and it travels through here. The sample will be injected via a syringe here. So the carrier gas carries it through the column, so 30 meters, so it's traveling through here, and the components are interacting with the stationary phase, but they are dissolving into it. And once they get through the column, the time it takes, it's taken from there to, to there, the detector is measured. And then that's plotted on the chromatogram. So a little bit about retention times. So the greater the interaction, remember that's relative solubility between the component and the stationary phase, the slower the component moves through the column, and so it's going to have a longer retention time. So a little example here, if a stationary phase is a non-polar substance, so it could be an alkane, if you've got non-polar and polar compounds in your mixture, the non-polar, remember like dissolves like, the non-polar compounds will interact the most, and they'll be slowed down and have longer retention times. The polar compounds in your mixture wouldn't be interacting at all, and so they would go through fairly quickly and have short retention times. And of course, if it was the other way around, so you had a polar stationary phase, then the polar compounds would interact the most, and the non-polar would go through quicker. So we'll just have a quick look at a typical gas chromatogram. So this is of a blood sample, so this could be utilised um, to give evidence for, let's say, drink driving. You can see peak number three is for ethanol. So we can measure the percentage of the component in the mixture by measuring the area under a particular peak and then dividing that by the total area of all the peaks. The area of the peak is proportional to the amount of the component in the sample. So if you've got um, a large amount, let's say, of ethanol in your blood, the peak area would reflect that. Now we can measure the concentration of a component by comparing it with a calibration curve. So we'll look at that next. So calibration curve, how do you do that? You'd need to prepare solutions of known concentration of the compound that you're investigating. So we prepare standard solutions. We obtain a gas chromatogram for each of those standard solutions. And then we plot the calibration curve. So we've got the peak area and we know the concentration. So we can plot that as a curve. And then once we run our, our sample, um, so the compound that we're investigating, we can measure the area of that peak and then compare it with our calibration curve and that will give us the concentration that we've got in our sample. So we'll finish with some limitations of gas chromatography. So some compounds might have the same retention times, especially if they're very similar in structure. If you've got a large concentration of one compound and a small concentration of another, and they've got similar retention times, you could have one peak sort of hidden uh, by another one. Again, if you've got a totally unknown compound, you may not have the retention time data on your database to compare to. So often they would use gas chromatography alongside mass spec. So two analytical techniques side by side, so it's GCMS for short. So GC, gas chromatography is great for separating compounds in a mixture. And then mass spec would be used to confirm the identity of each of your components because they can very, very accurately measure to sort of four or five decimal places, your MR. And also, fragmentation patterns are unique, so they're a bit like a fingerprint, um, and you can compare that to your database.